Hey, stranger. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Ryan Chummy Crash Reynolds, and this is my co-host, Adrian Bertazoy Townsend. Whoop. And you're listening to Just A Bit Gaming, all the fun of gaming without any of the achievements. Also, what's up, man? Hey, dude. Uh, you know what I did? What did you did? I beat God of War. You did not. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to borrow it now. <laughs> you are going to borrow it. <laughs> but before you borrow it, I'm going to tell you and all the all the listeners out there about my opinion of the game. Ooh, we're just going to bust right I'm into gonna it. I'm going to go right into it, man. All right. Well, no, how do you do? Let's I, just... I, Let's, I mean, fuck I, it, dude. I just get into it. The The thing is about God of War is it is a game that I absolutely yeah. could not put down. Would you say it was great? It was great God of War. Gratos. Gratos. That's right. It was Gratos. <laughs> I made the mistake of playing that game in front of... Did you say uh, bistake? Bistake. I think that's Spanish for steak, for, for beef. Is it really? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, I might have made that up. You you probably did. It sounds like you did. But I made a mistake of mistake of playing it in front of Owen. Did it spook him? No, he loves it. Ah. And he is all about like knowing what's going on. And he remembers the parts that he should not remember. Like the graphic parts. So right. I feel like dad of the of year right now for well, showing him that stuff. <laughs> but he loves Have you started calling him boy as a result of it. Oh yeah, yeah. he hates it. He hates it. <laughs> I even I even do the whole Kratos voice. Get over here, boy. Boy, control yourself. <laughs> he he hates that I call him boy. I was like, I can't. That's what Kratos does. It's it's boy. It, it's so funny because for the longest time Owen thought that uh Atreus' name was boy. And I'd explain, no, his name is actually Atreus, but his dad, Kratos, calls him boy. Yes. And he's like, why? His name's Atreus. It's like, because he's Kratos and Kratos doesn't like to use names. I don't know. He kills <laughs> gods. You know, that's what he does. He answers to literally nobody. <laughs> Least of all, a, a boy. Yeah. <laughs> um, And he's really been drawn to Atreus, too. I, I think he likes that character. This kid who is pretty much a badass. Yeah. Atreus is is a badass in this game. Like I thought he was going to be a character that's might hinder you a little bit, you know, um, like open up the world to Kratos compassionate side. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then dad, maybe like Daddy Kratos, the, there might be times where I have to rescue him from bad situations. If we get caught up, I was like, I don't want that extra level right. of bullshit because mm -hmm. that's what it is. Um, I hate, um, Escort missions and stuff like that. <clears throat> it's just, it's fucking filler. It's, it's ridiculous. Escort and it, yeah. Missions are and, and they take forever. And if you fail, you got to start all the way over again. Yeah. No. And if you get caught, you have to admit that you found it on Craigslist. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, the, the thing is with Atreus, he is such a great, like side hand. Like you have a, the square button basically controls Atreus while you're in battle and he'll shoot arrows at the enemies. And he's got different abilities that he can use with these arrows, like stunning electricity, stuff like that. Right. And <clears throat> the dude is, he does some major damage. I upgraded the crap out of his bow and he is a real asset and I, I he's a badass. And then later on in the game, you'll see some scenes, some story scenes of him using his badassery and, it's so cool. The game is amazing. That's cool. Um, I want to start with uh, the story. The story was, was it was a story. I, I was not super impressed with the story. It wasn't the driving force to keep me playing. Right. Uh, really, that falls on the gameplay and the exploration. That's what kept me coming back. The gameplay is so fucking fun. It is just amazing. Um, I've watched a lot of videos of the gameplay, and it looks pretty phenomenal. It is. Uh I'll, I'll get into the gameplay a little bit further, but just to touch a little bit more on the story without getting into spoilers, it, the characters are really, really good. Um, the characters kept me coming back. Like even Kratos becomes more of a likable character in this game than he was in the previous games. Yeah. Um, he's, he's mellowed out a lot over the years and it shows like even from the, from the point you start the game, uh, through the throughout the entirety of the game, you'll see him soften up as as the game progresses. Well, I mean, he even grew a beard. He even grew a beard. He he got fluffy. Is what he happened. got less white. I don't know if you noticed from the screenshots. He's not I did. Nearly... He, he's less 
what he's more like he was ashy yeah he had before, well because literally the ashes of ashes. his family yeah i do do you think did they ever did they ever touch on that his his complexion no in the game no they don't do you feel like that's something that they just kind of casually tossed in like we're sick of this guy looking like a it's, ashy ghost and well it's no it's still like a part of him and who he right. is because it's the ashes of his dead family that he killed. Right. And that still weighs heavy on him. From, from the first game. But he doesn't... He's more He's more Caucasian. He's white in skin tone now. Not so much white as in ashes white. Right. It's really kind of weird. It's like, so you get older and the ashes start falling off? I thought that was a curse that you had to live with for the rest or of your life. Maybe he's just like hella dirty. Or that. Right. <laughs> that could be you it know, too. Like maybe he all just, the blood and everything. All the blood and dirt and... Yeah. Anger, anger, <laughs> you know, you know, he's had at least a couple of cigars float through his life. Yeah, that's or true. Dirty pubs Smoke. or whatever. Yeah. I mean, he's just he's just a dirty fella. I think probably I don't know that Kratos, that he doesn't strike me as the type of character to be like, well, uh, there's no one for me to fucking kill. So I'm going to take a bath. Uh, it, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, and the thing is, is. He's he's mellowed out to the point where he, he doesn't really have that temper anymore either, which is really kind of weird and off putting for his character, but it makes sense within the storyline. Well, because he's a papa now. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. He's, he's got to be exactly. more patient. That's, that's absolutely true. You can't true. chop off someone's head for taking a bite of one of your chimkin yeah. burgers. You've just got to, you got to share. Well, having, having a son really, really brought him back down to earth and he realized how much he his temper kind of ruined his life uh, in the previous games. Yeah. And it's, it's really the character arc in that game is really great for all of the characters you've got. There's only maybe there's less than 10 main characters in this game. In, enemies included. Right. And all of them have such a strong characteristics and storyline backstories, all of that stuff that it really, that, that <clears throat> to me was was super interesting, but the overall story and what it is you, you were trying to achieve within the game fell kind of flat to me. It wasn't it wasn't as entertaining. Right. And in fact, most times I, I would zone out when the story was happening just because it wasn't it wasn't doing it for me. Well, this is going to sound so fucking stupid to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of a way to preface it. I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> let's see. I'm trying to think of a not stupid way to say this. This installment, I think, was aimed at being more realistic and believable than the previous installments. Yeah. Because if you look at the original installments, the original handful of God of War games, I mean, what year did the fucking first one come out? Like, oh, five, oh, six, somewhere yeah, in there. Maybe, maybe even that recent. Yeah. You know? But I mean, it's like early 2000s. It was being played by kids in silver pants with spiked blonde hair. That's right. You know? <laughs> I, I had friends that would play these types of games and have like an in sync album playing in the background, you know, like early two thousands, yeah. like Heelys and soaps, Walkman bullshit, you know. Gotcha. And you think of how exaggerated the character design even was, like yeah. the the spiky jaw that he had, like the exaggerated jawline and the the tuft of yeah fur on his chin you know uh who was the basis for anthrax he had the same thing going on you know what yeah i i, I don't know the guy's name um, or anything but i can Scott picture the Ian? style was that his name that was kind of the rocker style that was the, the rocker style and they designed him to kind of look like he emulated that early 2000s I, like rocker style badass that's you a know, connection like, i've never seen before like but yeah, it makes sense might would have hired him to bounce at one of their shows <laughs> that's right and even all the way down to like his weapon design was so exaggerated yeah you know those big spiky blades with the chains and all of that and the super white skin with the super red tattoo yeah and this game <clears throat> it you know he wouldn't look out of place in a more i guess realistically air quotes rendered environment like you know like skyrim or something like that with the beard and the more realistic skin tone his tattoos aren't so bright red anymore yeah. his weapon designs look more realistic look more almost historical than like something you would maybe buy at guitar center well yeah and it ma like you said it you matches know? it mass matches the norse 
mythology right. that he is a part of now. And they they set for for a game that's still set in this mythological world in this mm-hmm. mythological sense. I feel like they set a much more realistic tone than any of the past installments. That's absolutely true. And even down to how the game is toned down significantly, the violence, it, while the game is still violent, it is not nearly as obscene as the previous games were. The right. games were obscene for the, for the basically because they could be. And it was that, that was, I think a sign of the times. Like I remember it's trying to be, edgy for a video yeah, game. Yeah, it was like the second or third installment. I don't really remember, but I remember specifically there was this move. There was like a, like one of the, you know, fucking bad guys or <laughs> one of your assailants or nemeses or whatever that you have to fight in one of the levels was uh, like, like a, an elephant guy. Yeah. And like you grabbed him by his tusk and pulled up on his head and pulled him down to the ground. Yep. And then you had one of your swords in the back of his head and then started bashing him across the head with your other one. And then his skull splits open yep. and you see his brain. I remember and that blood starts spraying. And I remember that in comparison to some of the gameplay footage I've seen on this. Uh-huh. And I'm like, well, there goes that neighborhood. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> gone. And the thing is, is I'm OK with it. Well, I, I don't miss it. Like, it, yeah, it was. It like was, there was one scene in particular in God of War three. Did you play that one? I didn't play the whole thing. There was a God that he killed in God of War three and he literally ripped his head off, like pulled his head off and they showed it and it was very graphic and just disturbing. And it, you know, it wasn't cool to me. I didn't like that part of the game right. at all. But once again, kind of a sign of the times like that early two thousands hyper exaggerated mentality of everything. It makes sense that that's how the, the violence was. Everything yeah. was gratuitous in the early two thousands. It, it, it was, it was, a, it was playing around because they could, you know, they, exactly. they were getting away with what they could get away with. And a lot of games <clears throat> and movies and everything were kind of playing on that super, super gore, yeah. you know, and that super violence on top of that. The other thing, um, the God of war games are known for you. You're, you're going to see some, animated boobies in that yeah, game. Yeah. Yeah. So I was fully expecting to see that in this game and you don't, you don't see them at all, which is another sign of them getting away from that over the top. You know, not yeah. only, not only with the, it was needless nudity. It was basically there for, it was for there. male fan service or whatever. It was there to be there. Yeah. Have any of the games ever shown Kratos underworld? No, no, no. They always cut away the to the side and they see, you see something on the table kind of, Move it around uh, while he's doing his they, thing. Never, and it's, it's always a quick time event where you got to push the buttons. <laughs> they were always really funny. You can find the button. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they were always really funny. And I, I, I thought, oh, they're going to do this in this game. They can't because it's in every single God of War game. Why well, wouldn't at they? At this point, it's almost, it would be too realistic, <laughs> you know? Yeah. At, at this point, it, there's too much realism in it. But it also speaks to. And plus, what would boy do? <laughs> yeah right <laughs> stand outside boy i have some business to take your nose own. in the corner boy <laughs> the uh it, it speaks a lot to how they've changed the character matured the character and uh i think it it was it was necessary and everything they did i i love how they evolved the character new kratos is a lot better character than old kratos i i prefer him much more not yeah. not only in not only in his uh, demeanor and how he is, but his character design overall, I think is, is a stronger look. Oh, it's yeah. yeah. I, I've got a thing like a, an obsession with finding like picture evolutions. Yeah. Of, of characters. I love those. Yeah. Uh, okay. So today fat big and I got on Hulu and we started watching Sonic boom. Yeah. That computer animated Sonic show. It's not bad. I've never it's, seen it. It's a kid's show with yeah. a modern Sonic and Knuckles and Tails and that whole crew, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I got I got on this tangent looking at all of those old characters and their evolution over the years. And I did that the other day with Kratos. And, you know, there's an, ast- an installment of God of War. I don't remember which one it is that uh, his tattoos are on the right side of his body instead of his left. Oh, weird. Yeah. Like there's no, I didn't one installment where his tattoos are on the wrong side. I bet you it was uh one of the PSP games. It was, it yeah. was one of the PSP games. 
uh, and then like you've got these varying angles of jawline over the years, like <laughs> where it was like, let's make this super exaggerated, just fucking angry muscle guy, yeah, with some tattoos. Like I said, Scott Ian of Anthrax, but on like a shit ton of PCP, and just killed his family. So then the second one, they're like, you know what wasn't exaggerated enough? His jawline. Yeah. <laughs> so let's make it more like wings off the sides of his face. Yeah. You know, or like uh, the brim of a fedora. Yeah. You know, and then they kind of brought it back down and then the varying lengths of the chin hair. And then suddenly you're like, boom, here is fucking real ass. Norse mythologically. Yeah. Correct. Whatever. Whatever stupid words I just tried to put out of my <laughs> mouth. And uh, all the way down to like the anatomy of his musculature and everything oh, yeah. is. It's more realistic in yeah, every it, way. It's like before his like his ab muscles were like like a top down view of a tin of muffins. <laughs> That's right. Pop, 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 pop. And now it actually looks like, you know, like a later middle aged guy in like super great shape. It does. And you can kind of see like the stress marks on his skin yeah. and the uneven musculature underneath it and everything like it's it's a very impressive and i guess fluid redesign it's it's just it, well, and it, the, it works it's marketable for, that for also sure. that yeah all those points are lead into my next point which is the graphics and how realistic they made everything is truly amazing right like i know i was speaking last week about how you could see the pores in his skin and just everything was done to an incredible amount of detail and it's, it looks so good. Uh, the environments that you visit are varied and beautiful to look at. Some environments are super colorful. Other, other environments are dark and dreary, you know, or everything looks great. Um, the sense of, uh, the sense of scale, you know, they've got giants and other really big characters. Cause that was another big aspect of the old God of wars is that sense of scale. I remember I'll never forget God of war two. When you're walking down the chains to go to the, the horses, the yeah. big stone horses yeah. and how the camera just pulled back and you look at how tiny your character becomes Kratos becomes in relation to this giant chain. And yeah. Oh man. Like that. And, and you know, with the Titans, that, aspect of it uh when you fought in the first god of war when you fought the uh the very first boss that kind of uh what was it a, a hydra yeah it was a hydra and man it was and you feel like <clears throat> i i remember playing that boss the first time and when he popped out of the water uh i was playing it my my brother was watching he was sitting there with me and i remember him like freaking out like yeah how big this creature was like how are we actually going to fight this thing you know he because i mean we were kids we'd get so into it and he was like on his feet like yeah. watching and i was like i mean you know what though i'm i'm kratos right now i am so kratos right now and just feeling like so small and so mighty at the same time yeah you know like i remember the first game being at least to me it felt entertainingly too easy like it was just a step easier than it needed to be, but just enough that it made you feel like a badass. It and made not you like feel it was being handed to you. It made you feel overly powerful because right. of your swords, your knives could, you could basically circle your entire body with your attacks. Yes. Nothing could touch you. It felt yeah. like, no, I agree. Um, that, that, that sense, like the first God of war, when I remember very vividly, when I first played it, it was, it amazed me at how crazy the graphics were the, at the time, the graphics were amazing. The yeah. gameplay was so spot on and solid. Like it felt good. You felt like a badass playing as Kratos. Absolutely. This game does the same thing. Oh, man, I have that's not so good. I have not. I feel like this is the proper step up for the God of war character or the God of war games. It does everything. As far as gameplay, it does everything right. And it does it the way I remember. Um, so I guess like to lead off of that, the combat, you have an ax now instead of your, <clears throat> your two knives, chain knives. I don't know what you call them. B Blades of chaos. That's what they're called. Yeah. So you have a, you have an ax now and the ax comes back to you. Like call, Thor would call back his hammer. Okay. So you throw it, you call it back, or you can just wail on guys with it like a sword. Um, it, 
feels so good to to battle in that game. Everything is so fluid. You you hit R1 and R2 to do your attacks. You don't use the face buttons. Do the attacks feel like they have weight to them? Oh, absolutely. Yes. So you feel like you're wielding this he- big, heavy axe that right. only one person could use. Um, the sound effects when you're hitting through enemies, when you're throwing your axe, the sound effects are so good. And actually, I don't, I don't know that this game would feel as impactful without the sound effects. The sound effects go a long ways to, to helping that effect. Um, but being able to just be anywhere and throw your ax and then keep willing on a guy with your fist, call your ax back, hit him again. It's like everything flows in a way that's just so comfortable and that's cool. Easy. Like it, it nothing, nothing felt overly complicated. I, I don't like action games that have all these combos that you have to memorize. And if you don't memorize them, devil may cry is, is one that comes to mind. Uh, if you don't memorize the combos, <clears throat> you can get, the game can get really hard really fast. This game doesn't really do that. While it's beneficial to memorize the combos and, and do well with those, you can get away with not. You can and still feel like a badass. Um, Just actually enjoy a more fluid play style yeah. as opposed to having to calculate every move. Right. That's good. I mean, Having to watch enemy attacks and know how to counter and stuff. Those are all good, and a lot of people appreciate those. I don't. like. I don't want to get that far into it. No, I just want to be able to beat up the bad guys exactly that's why i never much feel cared good for the doing Devil may it. cry series you yeah know? i could never get into it Devil may cry well, is a hard game it's a very that's playing that game is a very heightened experience with the bah, 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 bah. yeah you know, that sound effect doesn't really convey exactly what i'm trying to say right now unless you saw me flailing my hands like an idiot <laughs> uh then i i'm i'm sure you got what i meant maybe without the hand without the gesticulation you'd be like well well, the, the turn into a fire, the devil may cry series. I love it too, because it, it's another game that makes you feel like a badass when you're just action games in general. Bayonetta is another great one, right? I love games like that, that just, uh, combat oriented, just, but that feel good. The beat them up, they the do hack and well. slash games. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, those, those, that was my play style for the longest time was hack and slash games. I played those almost primarily. Oh yeah, that's for, a good choice. For years. That's a good choice. Until I discovered my love of the open sandbox, yeah. you know, like modular type games with customizable characters. If you want to feel that. like you are um in control of a situation, get good at one of those games cuz that's that's what it does for me. That's that's fair. That's fair. Uh so uh the combat besides having your axe, you can do fists, you can uh hit guys with with your fist and hit them with your shield. You've got special attacks that you can, uh, like knock people back. You have Atreus also, as I said before, with his, his bow and arrow, there's a lot of variation in the combat. That's so, cool. And it all is tied to a different button and the button combos are, are easy to pull off. Uh, there's, there's a few surprises later on in the game, both gameplay and storyline wise that are really, really cool that, uh, especially one of them, and it's a huge spoiler, so I'm not going to say what it is. Well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's it was let's just say it when when that part of the game happened, it was super satisfying and awesome. And I loved it. <clears throat> so as you're playing, can you uh, customize his look at all? Yes, you can. So you find new gear and it's all color coded like a like a MMO RPG would be. Oh, that's that's cool. So you have like green is the weakest. Gray is the weakest. Then green. Then like orange or maybe blue, no blue, purple, then orange or something like that. I don't know, but they're tiered in, in the level that they are, but it also changes the way he looks. So he's not just limited to exactly what you see there uh, as far as padding and clothing goes. And you can, you can buy new shoulder pads, um, whatever the leg skirt thing is called that he wears. Pauldrons. Yeah. Is that what those are? Or no. Do pauldrons go on your shoulders or do they go on oh, your thighs? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. No, it's on your shoulders. Well, whatever it is, it's your it's your bottom wear. And then you got <laughs> you got arm guards as well that you can upgrade. <clears throat> you can also grow upgrade your axe. Uh yeah. Can you like can you change his face hair? Nothing like that. Or, no. no. It's all it's all clothing. You can't you can't fuck with his physique. No. That's with his bot of war. <laughs> yeah i like that no uh and atreus too you can change atreus's clothes with 
upgraded clothes and stuff. Yeah. And it's cool. It's good to see that. Uh, it keeps pants you in puffy skate shoes. Yeah. Well, it, that aspect of the game really helps you want to explore more because you yeah. can get that stuff. You can also find Which things. I'm explore when I play games anyway. Dude, there's so much to do with ex- exploration. Uh, there's there's places that I haven't even seen yet and I beat the game. So there's a lot to this game. There's different realms that you can right. travel to. Now on your, okay. So on your weapons and armor, uh, you know, say you pick up and you're really enjoying a particular, is it all axes? It's the same axe. It's the same axe that gets upgraded. That gets, okay. So it's upgrades you find. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask. So you don't necessarily find new weapons. Right. You just find upgrades for what you've got. Right. And okay. you got these two dwarf characters that upgrade your weapon for you and they progressively do it throughout the game. So, and they, every time they upgrade it for you, it changes slightly in appearance. So you feel like you're getting a new weapon anyway. Oh, that's cool. I can get with that. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's cool. Um, so the enemies, I wanted to talk about the enemies a little bit. I felt they were a little bit lacking. I didn't have, I didn't have, None of them were memorable. Let's just say that. <laughs> I, forgot, uh, I forgot to bring beer, but I brought an energy drink. <laughs> <that's right. laughs> um, none of the enemies really struck a chord with me for being like, like I can remember specific enemies, like the elephant enemy that you mentioned. Like right. I can remember those enemies in God of War. I don't know why I remember that one specifically. Because of the cut in the head. The, open. That's pretty, the pretty graphic. must have just stuck with yeah. me. This one doesn't, I mean, they have a few enemies that you could remember, but the the main enemy that you're going to be fighting throughout the course of the game, they're pretty like. I don't know what the word is. They're they're just not they're not visually pleasing. Pretty basic. Super basic. They walk yeah. around in Uggs carrying mocha lattes. <laughs> exactly. They just <laughs> say things like I can't even with Kratos right now. <laughs> <laughs> they they they're monsters that have like fire blood or ice blood they're they're kind of related to an element and they're just oh, very throwaway man that sounds a little like phoning it into me it is it's it's not it's not great um like did you ever see the movie grandma's boy oh i love that movie man well of course of course you have that's a you great know, movie when they're talking about the what is it the the trolls on level four looking the same as the goblins on level six or whatever yeah and they're just like we'll just change the fucking color and yeah you know it'll be fine that's what they do. It kind of feels like that. They do have, they do change. You're not the first one that's mentioned that to me. Really? Talking about this game. So when I first, when you first encounter an enemy in the game and, and fight them, I, it was very underwhelming. Let's just say, and I found, I was like, Oh, so that's who I'm going to be fighting for a while. The, this is not cool. You know, it's, it's uninspired. There's not, there's not much going on there. And they do have some bigger enemies and they're recycled throughout and they might change them up a little bit to, you know, have a different element and they may look slightly different, but they're still throwaway. Not very interesting. Sure. And they have like a handful of, uh, bigger enemies, more powerful enemies, and they're all reskins. So you'll, once you fight that enemy, once you'll fight them again and again, again, and they're always going to be that way. And they're always going to be, they're always going to have the same attack patterns and everything. It's just, they may like, they have trolls. They have these big giant, like, trolls or something. I don't know what they're called. You fight one in the beginning of the game and it's really kind of cool. It's like, wow, I can't wait to see what other kind of, uh, bad guys I fight like that. Right. Well, I'm sorry. I'd spoil it here, but you're going to fight that troll over and over and over again throughout the course of the game. He's yeah. going to have different elements and, and you know, he's just not, he's not as exciting. You know, it's, <clears throat> that's unfortunate. It was disappointing. That is unfortunate. It was it but was something that I felt could be approved for the sec- for the next game. Are the boss battles impactful enough to make up for that? To mitigate the boring That's another element baddies. that I I think there's not enough boss battles in this game there's for not- me. There are boss battles. They're few and far between. Um they are cool. They are very cool. In fact, all of I can remember each of the boss battles that I did in this game. Yeah. They are they are definitely awesome. Um, very uh, cinematic. So the the cinematic boss battles are exactly like how they are in the old games, where you're fighting this big big boss and you start wailing on them, and then all of a sudden the camera will take over and you might do a quick time event or not. Some that's kind of it's not as prevalent as it was in the old games, but it's still there. 
uh, with the, with the quick time stuff. Um, but yeah, those, those are super, super cool. I enjoyed the hell out of well, watching I'm, I'm glad that they stuck with at least something similar on that formula, because that's, that's one of the things that always God of War had going for it, you know? Yeah. Was those, that, that scope and breadth of those boss battles that, I mean, let's be honest, most, if not all of the God of War games have felt suspiciously linear at times. Yeah. You know, they are. This one is not, this which one is, is great, not, which I, I read, uh, which is exciting because that wears me out. Yeah. You know, uh, kind of like whenever we were both playing Knack. Uh, Knack is so linear. It hurts. It's just like <clears throat> this, this, this boss fight. Yeah. This, this, this boss fight. Uh, and then, you know, that Ratchet and Clank is still pretty linear, but mixes it up, you know, yeah. from time to time and bouncing back between worlds. And then, you know, you'll have a random world that's more open. I'm glad to hear that this installment, they did away with kind of that dungeon to dungeon point A to point B yeah. mentality. Yeah. Cause it, that just gets under my skin. Where's me. Out? And it's, and it's I still there in the place that way for people who, who like that, like me, I'm, I'm okay with that kind of linearity. I like having an end goal, right? Those elements are still within the game, but it's not, it's not, it's not the whole game exploration. I think it's evenly weighted with those dungeons and exploration. So you can have cool. both of those. Um, the things though, that, that really kind of I wish could have been improved on besides the enemies is the and the boss battles. I wish there were some more boss battles. Right. But I also I didn't get the the sense of awe that I got from the other games. You know, like like the instance I was telling you about when you're walking down the chain or when you run into that Titan for the first time. They do have a few of those, but there's so few of them. The parts that really struck me in the old games. I didn't have as many of those in this game. And maybe it's just because I'm not as interested in Norse mythology as I am in, in Greek mythology. Yeah. I mean, I think that might have a whole lot to do with it. Although after playing this game, I am super interested in wanting to find out more about Norse mythology. I even went as yeah. far as to look online. There's a book on audible about Norse mythology. That's supposedly really good. I'm thinking about picking that one up to, to listen just because I don't really know anything about Norse mythology. I know Odin and Thor and that's about it. And that's, even then I only know the Marvel versions of them. Exactly. <laughs> Wearing my Marvel <laughs> comics shirt right now. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, it did spark my interest. That's uh, cool. If, if not just a little bit. Okay. <laughs> not, so one of 10. What would you give this game? Oh, definite, definite nine at the very least. A good nine. Oh yeah. Nice solid solid nine. nine. Okay. Um, what do you think will be the next set of mythology? This team tries to conquer. I think they still have a long ways to go within the Norse mythology without giving away any spoilers. I feel nothing? like they didn't explore as much as they can. And I think they did that intentionally to set up more sequels. Do you feel like with the story ending, they left it open for a direct sequel? They closed out the story pretty well. Yeah. But that's not to say that they couldn't create a sequel. There's, there's absolutely room for sequels. And I feel like, I feel like I want to spoil stuff. So I, I, I probably need to get away from this subject. Cause there's, there's a lot, there was a lot unexplored in this game. A lot. And a lot of questions left unanswered. Uh, nothing, no major questions, just subtle questions, you know, but still questions nonetheless that needed to be answered. Um, How many games do you think we'll have to get through before Kratos conquers the American frontier? <laughs> <laughs> What's after Norse? <laughs> the American frontier. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's all kinds of fucking cultures with, with their there is. demons and gods. I know that the, the Celts had a lot of superstition. Um, or we could, uh, they could. He didn't do Roman mythology they didn't at all. Do Roman mythology. Wait. Greek and Roman are they the same? I don't no, know. no, no. Uh, I think Ghost of Sparta would have been Roman mythology. Is it? Yeah, I, I don't know. So. I don't know. Uh, they do African mythology. That might get touchy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, like, really, or like ancient Chinese or Japanese mythology. Any. 
old culture in the world, aside from like America and Canada have like struck. And I don't know about Canada. I know that they speak French and are way nicer than us. So at maybe that point, they weren't superstitious enough. I don't know anything about Canada. Really? I know America isn't old enough to have any real mythology other than the cowboys and Indians thing, but any like old established civilizations, like from the old world is going to have their gods and demons and mythology and all of that. Well, you could go native American if you want to do it. You could do native American. Yeah. There's so many different tribes and stuff. I think it'd be hard to do maybe, or it might be like just totally awesome. It could be. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, I'm sure a lot of people would be interested to know about Native American mythology or. or sure. But I, I I just feel like if they're going to do it, they might as well just go full tilt and globalize that bitch. You know, uh, honestly, though, I don't think I don't think they really need to. I think they could end it at Norse mythology. I think they could do another two games. In fact, I th- heard that the uh, game designer said that. Yeah. He's got room for five more games. Oh, maybe this. they do a pirate one. Yeah. Well, they. I don't know. Like that wouldn't be interesting fight. to me. He's got to fight like the. But Kraken you don't want to. You don't want to turn Kratos into the Assassin's Creed. You know what I mean? Well, that's true. That's true. Kratos needs to stay where he is and just let's keep his story kind of stay in his lane. Center. Yeah. Right. Uh, the game is great. I'm curious to know your thoughts after you get a hold of it. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. It's a fun game, especially since I hear that you used to love playing hack and slash games like this. This game will be right up your alley. That is one of the biggest takeaways. This feels like a really great upgrade to that combat system. I can't wait to get Kratos right up my alley, man. (laughs) (laughs) I I don't think I want any of that. (laughs) Well, dude. um, So, Good. Good yeah. review. Good review. Thank you. <laughs> it was a good review. It was. It was a good conversation and a good review. And I think we both mentioned before we even started recording the fact that uh, people are already calling this one of the most influential games of this generation. They like are. for future games. Influencing future games already. That's right. They are. As far as mechanics, storyline, everything. I would, I would absolutely agree with that statement. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So going along with that same theme, we decided it would be a good idea to think about other games that we felt like were game changers, more or less games that were heavily influential to other games, either in the genre or all all around just basic game changers throughout time. So we came up with a list of five games that uh, Ryan's five and my five that we felt like were the most influential games. Yeah. Uh, so, Ryan, I would like to hear your number one or number five. Ooh, my number five, backgammon. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about <laughs> how that was game changing. <laughs> all right. I was going to say checkers, but that one was far too easy. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm going to say my number five is going to be Mario 64. Absolutely. That is also on my list. I thought that was funny that that one made both of our lists. <clears throat> it, it That one's it, higher up on yours. It's higher up on mine, but we could talk about it now because I, that game is, it was so influential in so many ways. It was the first great 3D platformer. And it had that platforming sense of linearity. Is that the, is that the word linearity? Is that a word? Or would it be a linear sense? Would it be a sense of linearity or a linear sense? You know, I think it could go both ways. Mm, yeah. It is 2018. <laughs> <laughs> so it had that sense, but it still had that sense of scope. Yeah. And it had a fucking killer reward system. Yeah. Like you felt like you were accomplishing things, but you also didn't feel tied down to a particular dungeon or a particular quest or a particular thought pattern. It was like, okay, I need this star from this level, I'm going to go run that level again. And And there was multiple ways that you could get there. Exactly. You could make your own decisions, play the game largely your way. Yeah. And largely in the order that you wanted to play it and progress. Yeah. And you could kind of put together your own play style of it. And it 
didn't get boring. Never did. And as far as those early generation 3D platformers like that, it did have a sense of cinema and grandeur that other games didn't have. Right. Absolutely. That sense of like just majesty of what you were doing. What I remember starting the game in the front lawn of the of the castle. Yeah. And looking up at the castle and realizing that 360 degrees, I could look around. There was nothing really to find at the time. Because it wasn't like today's games where you go snooting around through the bushes yeah. over in the far corner and find a block that you can break and climb two miles through a cave and find, you know, a new fucking pair of tennis shoes or something. Right. But it's still I, I could explore it. And we've talked before, like, that's my great passion in these games is to just just look around, see if I can get somewhere I'm not supposed to be. You that know? I think that was one of the first games that I can recall playing at that implemented that exploration exactly i remember whenever me and all my friends were playing it and we would have discussions about things we had found or little glitches yeah we'd come across like yeah uh, i remember in the front lawn of the castle if you did a triple jump at like the southwest corner of the lawn at just the right angle you could get up above the the wall and like through the invisible wall and fall into the matrix of the game <laughs> and we were all so stoked yeah to go home and try this yeah you know to try to there's nothing to achieve by it other no. than just getting through there man i miss those i miss those parts of gaming you know yeah like i, I had the same thing with with halo 2 like you could break the game in certain ways and yeah we would just we would just try forever and when we got it we would be super excited about it and it did nothing for the gameplay it was just no. it was just fun or like <clears throat> the endless staircase you know leading up to bowser yeah that you could like slide or flip or something like just the right amount of times that the endless staircase came to an end yeah. yeah, it's just like little things like that or or finding all 120 stars. Oh, man, that was just something I never actually accomplished. Oh, I haven't either. But my buddy did. He had the game and I would play it at his house. And that was our goal was to get all 120 stars. And he was super good at it. Um, and he finally did. And it was just it was fun to go out and explore and try to find those stars. And, you know, you we, we tried not to rely on guides and stuff. We would. Just, yeah, we just do it. I didn't play that game with a guide. Yeah, I don't think we did either. It it was it set the bar for 3D platforms as a whole. And I remember I didn't I was a PlayStation guy, not an N64 game or guy, and I really wanted a Mario 64 type game on my PlayStation. And if had I had the money as a kid, I would have had both systems, right. honestly. Of course. Because just for Mario alone, if nothing else, just for Mario. Uh but I remember trying out Crash Bandicoot and it didn't do it for me. Like it was not Mario 64. Every no game that I could play on the PlayStation measured up to that level. It just didn't. It didn't have it. <clears throat> no. It didn't have the juice, man. And it was disappointing to me. But so many games did try. It was a game changer. And a lot of games did attempt that formula and that style. It just nobody could quite right nail it just right. You know, I remember when Mario <clears throat> 64 came out and I went about ape shit wanting it so bad. And it was nowhere near, I mean, I think it came out, if I remember correctly, unless, I, don't, I think it came out in spring or summer. It was a spring game, I'm okay. pretty sure. And in my house, it was always, well, wait for your birthday or wait for Christmas. But if me and my siblings all wanted the same thing, my birthday's in November, then my sister's birthday's in December, then we have Christmas. Then my brother's birthday is in the last week of December. So if something comes out in the spring that we all three wanted, <laughs> you're screwed. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember wanting it so bad. And I was like, well, you know what? It is hot outside. So I'm not going to have this until I'm a man. You know, <laughs> And I remember my dad came home late from work one night. He had to go to the grocery store, went to Walmart and he came home with it. He had just bought it. Oh, man. And I went ballistic. He bought that in Star Fox. That is so funny. And I had to go to bed. I didn't get to play either of them that <laughs> night. <laughs> that is amazing. I did not sleep that night. That is amazing. I did. You not know sleep. what's funny about your story? It is almost identical to the, to the same story that I have in relation to the N64. Um, not for me, but for my buddy. My buddy, my friend had the N64. He was the only friend of mine that had the N64. And I played it at his house all the time. And I was with him when he got it. And our situation was so similar. We were at Walmart with his parents. They were grocery shopping 
And while we were there, we were, they had the N64 on demo and we were playing it the whole time that they were doing their shopping. And when they came back through, they were asking all kinds of questions about it. You know, I was like, okay. So we were very excited to tell them all about this new system. They thought it was super cool. They picked it up, put it in their cart. We went back to their house and played. We, we didn't sleep that night. Well, we played not. we played in 64 all freaking night long. Yeah. Mario 64 like was would. our jam, man. But it was it was another one of those situations where that never happens in my family it, it or his family. Happens. Nobody just randomly buys a system. So the N64 was such a powerful system. That game, Mario 64, was such a powerful game that it influenced parents to say, wow, this is super cool. Well, my know, kids need to have this. What it was is that if any of those parents like when I was growing up. We had the original NES in my house. Yeah. With the first two Mario Brothers games. Right. And Legend of Zelda and Contra. I think that was all the games we That's had. all you need. That's all you need. <laughs> that was all you fucking need. So that was the system we had until the N64 came yeah. out. And it never crossed any of our minds to want a newer system or need a newer system. That was just that was the video game we had. Yeah. And then the I think a lot of the parents of the generation before us maybe had that NES and had the original Mario experience or the original Zelda experience and then saw this, the N64. And I wonder if there was an, an almost an element of like, like bridging that generational yeah. gap. Like, yo dude, Mario was my shit first, you know, and then buy it and kind of experience it together. I know that was partially my dad's mentality of it was like, these are the same characters that I was playing before you guys were, Yeah, you know, so your, your parents Sentient, were, you know, you, or your dad at least was into, he probably bought it more because he was into that's what was becoming of gaming where, where gaming was going. It was dude, that stuff. It was impressive. Yeah. It was so impressive that that's what I don't think before did to people, man. We, we will never see a leap in video game technology like we did between the 16 and no. the 64 bit area. No, era. it will. It'll never happen again. It will never happen again. Until someone figures out how to like, I don't know. <laughs> you can't even think of it because it won't happen again. It won't happen again because even VR is just like, well, all right, that's VR. Yeah, right. It's it's, it's exactly it's what not it a, is. It's not a game changer. It is what it is. It's not it's, a game changer. It's not going to influence your parents to pick it up and surprise you because they think it's cool too. The next big step would have to be like, I, I don't know, like neural helmets yeah. With robots in an arena yeah. that you control and actually like real life rock 'em sock 'ems, you know? <laughs> Something drastic. That wouldn't even be video games anymore. I just don't, like you said, I don't know that gaming and technology has the capacity to make that drastic of a jump again. Yeah. Unless they somehow figure out how to make video games with live action s- scenery and live action characters. Even then. That are somehow controlled digitally. Yeah. Even then, I don't even think it would. I don't know. It, it would have to be, be something major because yeah. graphics are so impressive now that yeah. the jump still wouldn't be to scale there. Right. It was just such, that was a magical year when N64, it was a magical era. It was a magical year. And that also leads into your number four with it, with Ocarina of time, man. Ocarina of time is, is another good game changer. You're right. Um, I didn't have personal experience with this game when it came out. Mine didn't come till much later on. My friend didn't have it, so I didn't play it. So what, 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 why, why did you feel like that was a game changer for the time? First, my, my first response is that that was the first game that I ever touched that had that sense of scale to right. it and had that sense of openness. Very like, similar to Mario 64 Mario in that 64, way. Mario 64, you could explore, but it was a room at a time. Right. You know, and here in ocarina of time like even when you were still in the kikiri forest mm-hmm. i was I, I remember being blown away by how much freedom i had to run around how much autonomy i had to explore this corner and that except for this one when you go rooting around in the bushes you can find something to break and go fucking find something new. <laughs> and that was the world to me yeah like you can you can see when i talk about those particular games where my birth of gaming came from yeah you know and my my current play style where where it started where the roots took hold and then you get out into Hyrule and then, you know, and you just like, 
Here's Here it is. All of this. Go just where you want. Fucking walk somewhere yeah. and do something. I will say, no other game similar to Mario 64, no other game, at least on the PlayStation, was able to match that that scope and that feel. Exactly. That Ocarina of Time had. Never. <clears throat> and then, I mean, they hit on it again with Majora's Mask. Right. Now, Majora's Mask was a great game, and in a lot of ways, I like it better than Ocarina of Time. It closed a lot down a lot of that that openness though it closed a lot of that openness off and it closed a lot of your time frame off and a lot of the exploration off right uh stylistically speaking it was i mean even if you look at mario 64 versus ocarina of time just in that time in that in that amount of time that they had to polish the graphics and polish the characters and everything ocarina of time just looks that much more polished than mario it does looks that much smoother that much better the gameplay was fluid. It was the most cinematically impressive game I'd ever played. Oh, I agree. You know, not even just the cutscenes of the, you know, the middle of the night in the pouring rain with Ganondorf on his horse, bah, 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 <laughs> you know, and running off, you know, with the lightning behind him and everything. Not even just the cutscenes or pulling the sword out of the out of the pedestal of time. Yeah, you know. Everything was so beautiful and driven and meaningful and cinematic, but even like the final boss fight with Ganondorf in the top of the castle when you're shooting him with the light arrows. Oh, sorry. Spoiler alert. <laughs> even even the, the <coughs> fights were cinematic and they had like depth and meaning to them. And the reward system is incredible. That was the first game that I ever played that I felt like I could really do things to customize my character as little as it was, you know, like a different sword here, a different shield there, different boots. Yeah, but or different tunics, you know, it, it but it, it you had that freedom to, to mess with your character and mess with your buttons and mess with play the game. You wanted to play it and explore things. And I remember I think I've probably played and beaten that game in completion. Well, into the 20s of times. Wow. Like 20 or 30 times in my life. That's crazy. Easy. Like there, there are moments I'm playing it again right now on your 3ds. Yeah. It's in my backpack. <laughs> That's I nice. I take it everywhere with me and I, I'll put in five or 10 minutes when I can. Yeah. But like, sometimes I feel like if I close my eyes, I can play the game just based on sounds of what's happening around me. I've played it so <laughs> many times. So I, the first things I ever learned how to play on guitar were the ocarina tunes. Oh wow. You know, just on, on the high E string, just, just see i i wish i wish i had that kind of nostalgic attachment to the game but i I just don't it just it's a great game and i i really wanted a game like that on the playstation but i think that's where it's just because i didn't have the experience with it and it was it was a kid that did a lot for me too oh yeah that it was a kid yeah i had played games where you were a kid before Mm -hmm. but not to that immersive level yeah you know I could keep talking about Ocarina of Time all night. Yeah. I'm just going to stop here. <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever sentiment I was on, I'm, I'm done with. Okay. I, I could do this for days. I, I, I don't blame you, man. That is, I get just as passionate about the games that are special. Yeah. To me. That one is, <clears throat> it'll, it'll always have hold that spot. Oh, absolutely. You know? Um, which brings me to Medal of Honor. Oh yeah, we talked. I think we talked about Medal of Honor last week or last episode. We did briefly touch before. on it, yes. And that's one that always comes up with me. Yeah. Um. My actually, my wife gives me so much shit for what she calls my my off brand preference. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, um, she likes that movie Babe with the talking pig. Yeah. I always liked Gordy. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is like a, a genuine bone of contention in my marriage. <laughs> so, so you an ants fan over bugs, bugs life. When I was a kid, I preferred ants to bugs life. That was another oh, one that came man. up and, or, or small soldiers to toy story. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, that's too far. Okay. Okay. I really, really loved toy story when I was a kid, Yeah, but I kind of unveiled that love a bit because I was like, well, that's a fucking kids movie and I'm not a kid. And then Small Soldiers came out and I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> so in, it, I, I guess in practice at the time, yes, I preferred Small Soldiers. Okay. I, I had toys in the video game of that. No, that's still a lie. I had toys in the video game. I just, I love things involving toys. Okay. That's fine. Fair enough. So I've got this kind of off-brand mentality that she gives me shit for. 
in the no longer valid argument of Call of Duty versus Medal of Honor. Right. When that was a valid argument, I was 100% foot down. Team Medal of Honor. I was Medal of Honor to the fucking bone. Yeah. That is what started military They shooters. They are the original Nators. That's, I mean, they did it. And they did it well to begin with. I know other guys like Call of Duty and other games like that. They came after and they capitalized and they polished it. And right. they did a, a better enough job to get Medal of Honor to shut the fuck up. I guess we should say what it is. The World War II military shooter. Yeah, that, that first person <clears throat> competitive. Call of Duty became the Madden of shooting games. You know? Yeah. They basically put one out every year with a right. new roster. And it's still the same controls, but somehow it's supposed to be better. And people buy it, and I can't bitch because I buy them and play them too. Yeah, right. But, mark my words, if I got a notification on my phone that said, Hey, Medal of Honor's coming back. I, I'd be like, alright, fuck you, Call of Duty. I'm back on Medal of Honor. <laughs> I would. I loved those games. I, the last one I remember coming out was on the PS3, and I just remember that it was a big deal because the main character had a big beard or something. I don't remember what, what game it was, but I remember being not very impressed by the game. That was the problem. By the time the last Medal of Honor came out, it was underwhelming in comparison to the Call of Duties of the world. Yeah. And even even at the time, other games like, I mean, you had other games like Halo that had gotten so popular. Right. Or games like, you know, the at the time in PS2 and PS3, there were some strong Star Wars offerings. Yeah. It had a similar gameplay mechanic, you know? With the shooty shoots and the blasty blasts and the blowy <laughs> blows ups. So, I mean, it, maybe maybe I'm just so for it because of the nostalgia factor, but I wasn't really into shooters. I came, I started playing Medal of Honor kind of late in their heyday, and I started at the first one. Yeah. Even, even after there were a couple others out and kind of experienced all of them. Because those were the games that got me into shooters, even more than GoldenEye. I liked GoldenEye whenever it was whenever it was a thing. Right. And I had fun with it and other games of that ilk. But really, the first metal, first two Medal of Honors are what got me moving in that type of game. Like, I, I could see that. Completely. I remember the first Medal of Honor on PS1 being pretty influential on on me, not just me, but the industry as a whole. Yeah. I mean, I, I would like to think that we wouldn't have a call of duty without metal of honor. I, I wouldn't think so. Yeah. Because I, it just kind of seems like, no, and I love the call of duty games. I'm not knocking them at all. Right. It's a great franchise and they've done fucking phenomenal worldwide. I hear you. So I, yeah, big, big fan of the medal of honor series. I still have all of those old games. I, 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 I do agree with you. I, I do think it was a game changer at the time, at least for the World War II shooter, if not first person shooters as a whole. It, it brought this sounds stupid and maybe lofty, but I feel like it brought a. Like an extra element of tangibility to those historical events mm -hmm. to a generation that didn't really give a shit. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. And got, I, I can agree got with that. That got our generation to kind of give more of a shit about what happened then because they were accidentally learning about it while they played those games. And yeah, I agree. And it, like was, you had, it was an impactful. You never had any interest in Norse mythology. Right. And now you've played the new God of War and you do care. You, right. you want to learn more about it. I feel like on a level, Medal of Honor might have done that with our generation in World War II. I would agree with you there. Yeah. If if not on a grand scale, at least a little bit. Yeah. It, it got someone to give a shit that didn't give a shit before. Absolutely. And that's a big piece of it for me. I I, I can agree with you. If I didn't have respect for your home, I'd won for my homies <laughs> for my for my fallen medal of honor. Uh I'm lumping these in together for number two. Okay. The Oblivion series and the Fallout series. That I would do that too. That's yeah. I don't it's, have anything wrong with it's that. Just, it's just, it's Bethesda's sandbox wearing different hats. Yeah. That's all it is. It is. It's just, they're the same games with different gameplay elements, different environments. Different genre. Genre. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's all it is. Um, I, I think that's kind of, those are both kind of self-explanatory. How, how they're so groundbreaking, how they change the game. Well, every, every 
everybody has, there's been a lot of companies try to mock that style, but yet again, as with the Ocarina of Time and the Mario 64, nobody has been quite able to, to nail that, that openness. And I think, I think if we're going to narrow it down, it would really be more Elder Scrolls than Fallout. I would say Oblivion specifically. Oblivion specifically opened up a world Mm -hmm. to a degree. When Oblivion first happened and got popular, I had two friends and my brother that were playing it. And I made fun of all three of those guys mercilessly (laughs) for playing that game because it it was so deep. Okay. There was a point of my feelings were hurt because none of them would let me play it because they know how I played legend of Zelda. Yeah. And they were like, you'll never fucking get out of the first zone. No, no one would let me play that or star ocean consequently. Uh, because they were worried about how much time I would spend exploring. So instead I made fun of them <laughs> because, <laughs> because that makes sense. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, oh yeah. You know, running around, you're this fucking oblivion. Blah, 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 blah. Why don't you go outside? You dummy. You know? <laughs> Why don't you go explore your own backyard? So I, I can sympathize with your reasoning. <laughs> I was, I was young and impetuous. <laughs> what can I say? So it opened up these world, this world in a way that games hadn't before. You know, I don't have the sense of nostalgia for like oblivion that I do for Ocarina of time. Yeah. Um, and I don't have the sense of nostalgia or love for oblivion or any of those earlier titles like I do for Skyrim. Right. I, I dabbled in those earlier titles. Uh, I was dabbling in those whenever I was balls deep in fallout though, you know? Yeah. Um, great games. And by today's standards, like with the Goliath that became Skyrim, you know, over the, over the years, the cultural insanity of Skyrim, those games look pretty rough now. And they, they are, they play pretty rough now, but there is still that charm of being like this, this truly, you know, open world experience that, you know, is getting, you know, right at your fingertips. You can just go pretty, pretty well, wherever you damn well, please. Right. And that, you know, that influenced the, I feel like that influenced the evolution of like the Grand Theft Auto series and even, even down to like free to play games, you know, like in the PlayStation Network. I think it's. I think it influenced the open world genre as a whole. As, as a whole, it's kind of the godfather of it. I like, mean, before that, I don't recall many other games that allowed you the ability to go wherever you want or do whatever you want. You know, it just like wasn't it wasn't there or kill whoever you want. You know, like yeah, you, like you could do whatever you want in those games, just and for the sake of doing it. it in the first uh, in Oblivion, like I had never played an Elder Scrolls game prior to that. But I remember playing that game and being like, I cannot believe how much freedom I have in this game to do whatever I want. And it, it was it was amazing. For and that. before you, I mean, everyone's used to that style now. Right. You know, like the the people that the gamers that came after us, I mean, they're brought up on it right. That's their bread and butter, you know. But I remember that series is well, not series, but since Oblivion, it's been 12 years now. Yeah. Yeah, that's a long time. And I remember, you know, coming coming from a household that the NES was the only system we had. At my grandma's house, we had the original Sega. Right. And then we got the N64 and had games like Mario and Zelda. But, you know, for every one of those games, you had all kinds of riffraff to wade through. Not that any of it was necessarily bad. I'm just saying that, you know, Wave Race wasn't necessarily a gem. <laughs> <laughs> I love wave race. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. Uh, but I remember like making the transition into those more open world games. And I, I spent years being like, I fell in love with it immediately, but was never not overwhelmed by it. Yeah. You know, like there, there, I would find points where I'd sit down for hours and have a session of playing and be like, wow, I literally fucking, I did nothing. I accomplished nothing. I, I broke a wall and dug two so holes. So your, your gameplay style now, more or less. Yeah. 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 It, it really hasn't changed much. Right. You should see how little progress I've made in nearly a year of playing Breath of the Wild. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. You, yeah. It's impressive. I bet you I can ask you where you are and you still be in the same first town or wherever you were last time I 
Uh, yes. I haven't. Once you get off the Great Plateau, yeah, I have yet to finish the first actual story quest. Okay, yeah. So you're still way in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And that's not. It's not. I've spent a year playing this game. Let's I've just got, say that Breath of the Wild would not be Breath of the Wild without Elder oh, Scrolls. Hell no. No. It wouldn't be Breath of the Wild without Ocarina of Time because it's Zelda. It wouldn't be Breath of the Wild without Mario 64. <laughs> you know? Uh, honestly, yeah, you're right. Without it just, someone it's, starting that open world mentality and going, let's just let people let's do expand what they want. on that. Yes. Exactly. Instead of instead of lines for levels, let's just have this area with a bunch of shit and let them go. Be free. <laughs> have at it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Great series. Um, my number one that I think might be the most influential uh, for modern gaming is Guitar Hero. Absolutely. I agree. I think, and I, I, I'm i sure someone is listening to this is rolling their eyes like, you're going to put that over Zelda and, you know, Medal of Honor and all that shit. Hear me out. You, they, they brought the heat with Guitar Hero. Whenever that game came out, it was like fuck. It was like tickle me Elmo all over again. Oh yeah, people were fucking nuts about that game. And then you had what was Rock Band, Rock Band. and Band Hero, yep. Drum Hero, and and really Rhythm if Games. You think as a whole. about it. There could be an argument made that Guitar Hero was just humping DDR's leg. Yeah, if you really think about it. So DDR, uh, yes, DDR did start it. Hell, I would go back to say Power Rap of the Rapper started the, the rhythm genre. Rupa the Fupa. That's right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, with... with But Guitar Hero had had like a sense of insanity to it when it came out. It's something that, that like... ate it up. But because you could play a guitar, like nobody wants to... Not everybody wants to dance on a mat, right? Right. But, or rap. or Yeah, or any of that. But you're going to hold a guitar and push some buttons and feel like a you're actually playing like, a guitar. Yeah. That's appealing. I, I knew people that would play that game and suddenly think they could play guitar. Oh, yeah. It happened a lot. I had Dude, guitars. It did it to me. Like I knew I couldn't play a freaking guitar to save my life. But when I played that game, I felt like I was playing that like, song. Who has a six string? Let's go sit on the Starbucks patio. <laughs> yeah, dude. It's I, I can't tell you how many times playing that game, like having people over at half drunk in my apartment playing that game and then they'd grab one of my guitars and try to do the same moves and like oh, I had it just a minute ago. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, you did, you dumb dick. It was on five five buttons over there. But it, it had that effect on people. Yeah. And then all the the things that came after it, like the the rock band you know, drum star what the, everything. There were like so D, many copies. DJ hero. Yeah. And I'm I'm sure there was probably like a, a fucking trumpet hero. I mean You name it. It came out with everything. And then it hit the handheld market. Yeah. You know? And you had little Guitar Hero for like the DS. Right. Where it was in the palm of your hand. And then it hit mobile, mobile. games. Yep. And then you have this whole string of mobile rhythm games. There's thousands, maybe millions of these just little rhythm oriented clickers that probably would not have existed in the fashion they exist without Guitar Hero. Absolutely. I agree. I feel like as far as industry and play style goes... Guitar Hero was probably more influential than any of those games, at least on a fiscal level. You know that Guitar Hero copycats have made, I mean, they've, they've made a, a whole separate industry for themselves, a whole separate business model. You're right. And, and, and it reached out to, similar to how the Wii did, it reached out to a, even a non-gaming audience. Yeah. And it, it grabbed people that don't normally play games, whereas the other ga- the other games on your list they're still appealing to gamers. You're yeah. not, you're not going to pull in a lot of non gamers with those. It even influenced games <clears throat> like where you would actually have a guitar, a real guitar yeah. and plug into the game and learn the actual chords and notes playing along with. Yeah. The game. Yeah. It influenced shit like that. Yeah. Like real world, learn something new type stuff. Yeah, you're right. And so <clears throat> for that, I feel like guitar hero is one of the most sweeping Game changers. Game changers of our generation. Good list. Solid list. Um, I'm going to get into mine here. <coughs> we already talked about one of my games, Mario 64. But what's at the uh, number five for me uh, is a Final Fantasy game. And 
I chose this one because it was most influential on me, but it was also hugely influential on the on the uh, genre as a whole. And that's Final Fantasy VII. Final Fantasy VII. After that game came out, it it was like everybody was trying to come out with an RPG, a JRPG to match the breadth and the scope and the graphics of of Final Fantasy VII. And that is why I think the PS one is probably one of the best, if not the best RPG systems to date. Yeah. Um, now I know there were games before it on the super Nintendo specifically, super Nintendo had great RPGs, but it wasn't, it didn't reach the mass audience appeal until after final fantasy seven. Like for me, I had never even played an RPG until I touched final fantasy seven. In fact, I played actually that's that's wrong. I the anticipation for Final Fantasy 7 was so strong that it influenced me to go out and get another RPG that just came out uh before it called Wild Arms. Wild Arms yeah, was my yeah, first yeah. Uh, RPG and I loved it. Um and I would have never tried that game had I not played into the enthusiastic uh marketing that Final Fantasy 7 had. Man, I never played Wild Arms, but I remember when it came out uh, I had an issue of Game Informer that talked about it. Oh yeah, and had like a character gallery with like their designs. Yeah, I and love I was the character designs. Blown away. You know that is by a, the character design of that game. Th- that is a huge reason as to why I'm so into RPGs. The character designs, the level designs, is the everything. The there's so much awesome artwork that goes into those games, and I, I really appreciate that yeah. aspect of them. Uh, uh, Final Fantasy VII to, uh, is no exception to that rule. That is a beautiful game, or was then. It's it's not. It doesn't hold up great today, but I would still argue like a lot of the the backgrounds were hand drawn, and you would have your three D sprites on the hand drawn backgrounds. So cool. That's a that's a art that's gone. You know, yeah. games don't do that anymore, and that's a system that I miss. I'm waiting for a revival because I know it'll happen. Uh, but yeah, uh, Final Fantasy VII is it really set Square Enix off, or Square at the time is just SquareSoft. They had so many RPGs coming out on the PS1, so many other RPGs. Like there were so many RPGs coming out for the PS1 that I couldn't get a hold of all of them. Um, so yeah, for that reason, that's that's number five. Number four for me is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Hell yeah, dude! Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was a huge game changer. We had never seen like an extreme sports game like that that had the fun mass appeal that that game had. Like people. I knew people who didn't play games who were playing Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. They loved it. Uh, I remember the first, my first experience with it was with a, a demo disc. And I played that same level, that first level in that demo disc over, over and over again. And when that game came out, I, I bought it day one. It's that, that demo disc is in this stack of demos that I gave you. Is it? That PS2 disc. Oh man. It's in there. Dude, I would, I would play the heck out of it. I would collect all the skate letters and the tapes and everything. I I mastered that first level before the game came out. Um, but you had so many copycats after that. You had like the Dave Mira BMX. I played that game though. It, it was, act- did you ever play it? Yeah. It's not great. I played I, BMX triple X or BM. Remember that one? That was just bikes and boobs. Yeah. Bikes yeah. and boobs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it. Yeah. But I, and it sucked. I, it was I, horrible. It, it was. I remember playing that one. Um, I, I will come to Dave Mira's defense a little bit on his game. I played a lot of that game. Did you? I did during yeah. during the Tony Hawk stuff. I, I, think, I genuinely enjoyed that. I game. think that was an Activision game as well, though. So it, was. it was from the same company. It, yeah. it had a mode on there called Smash, and it was like where you got points for how severely you could wreck your bike. Oh yeah, and wreck yourself. Yeah, yeah. Or I think it was Smash, something like that. But that was it was a fun mode. Well, you had you had other skateboard imitators. I remember there was one. What was the magazine? A Thrasher. They had yeah. a Thrasher game. That game sucked. Yeah, it was bad. Which is was disappointing. I remember getting so I was jazzed for that game to come out because I played Tony Hawk. I looked at Thrasher magazine with my friends. I rode a skateboard. Yeah, and I was like, if anyone's gonna do it, it's gonna be Thrasher. That game was hot garbage. <laughs> it was hard garbage. Nobody could match that. I mean, at that time, nah, they killed it. Well, they also had they had surfing games that would try to match it. They had snowboarding, snowboarding, games. snowboarding. Oof. There wouldn't be an SSX without. No, uh, Tony Hawk, but SSX was bomb. SSX was cool. It set off, it set off a whole genre of games, I believe. Yeah. And, and also what it did for the, the character customization market, 
That oh yeah, series. that's a good point. Yeah, that series did a lot for that. I agree. Mentality. That was one of the first games to really allow mm-hmm. you to have that. Yeah, that scope with uh, char- character customization. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so um, my number three is Call of Duty Four, and I'm not going to talk too much about it since we touched on Call of yeah, Duty. Yeah, sure. But what I will say about Call of Duty Four is it really set up the modern first person shooter for many years. The whole standard of pushing left trigger to aim and the right trigger to shoot, that is and Call that, of Duty 4. That's golden standard. Now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All games do it. All games control schemes for first-person shooters originated from Call of Duty 4, which was a which was a play off of my number two, Halo. Halo started it, I think. Halo really modernized uh, multiplayer. It, it did. Online. Yeah. Uh, online and offline. You would have land parties with the first Halo. The first Halo wasn't online, but people would set up land parties constantly for that game. Um, so that game really, really set up multiplayer gaming as a whole for a lot of people. And it was super influential in that way. When the first Halo was out, uh, the church that I was going to at the time as a kid, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, I hadn't been... We don't need to get into my history of a church, <laughs> but this is the church I went to as a kid. And in my early teenage years, um, there was a house on the property of the church that the church bought from the original owners. And uh, they like held a town hall meeting for ideas for what we should turn this little house into instead of just storage. Right. And me and a couple of friends came up with the idea that we turn it into like a like a hangout, like a video games and coffee, like internet cafe absolutely for the That's high school great kids idea. and they did it they bit off wow on it. so they gave us a budget to like try to figure out what we could do with the place mm-hmm. and so we bought all these big screen tvs and like a couple of xboxes a couple of playstations a couple wow. of nintendos and then like some big like restaurant style like coffee and cappuccino makers and stuff and they give you quite a budget damn <laughs> well a lot of it ended up being like donations Cause it wow. was a church thing. Yeah. I mean, and plus they had a budget to buy the building, but the people that owned it went to the church and sold it to the church for a dollar. Wow. So there was and all this furniture and everything. And then our grand opening was a day, I think before the halo Two launch. And so our pastor like this was my, like my first, one of my first like jobs with little air quotes was that I, I helped set this place up and I like set up events like gaming competitions and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And, uh, have I never told you about this? No. Oh, set up like competitions and managed it and all of that. Um, I don't even remember what I got in exchange for maybe like scholarship money or something to mm-hmm. help me go to school or I know the pastor had given me a drum set cause I played in a band at the time. So I, I'm not really sure why I did all this work for them other than it was fun. Yeah. It sounds like it's uh, a blast. And I, I was there like five nights a week and, you know, putting together all these gaming competitions and little music events and cookouts in the backyard and everything. It was yeah. cool. It was, it was a cool thing for a 17 year old kid to be doing. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And I agree. Like being control of. <laughs> so. Big man on campus. Yeah. Our opening competition was a halo competition leading it was a 24 hour competition leading up to the release of halo 2 and the pastor had bought two or three copies of it so at the end of the halo competition the 24 hour competition everyone went home and then or maybe they didn't i don't really remember it's been so long ago but basically it led up to the winners of the halo competition got to sit down and have the first matches on halo 2 wow like as the prize that's cool yeah, it was really cool. And uh, that story wasn't terribly relevant to uh, no, it's, to you talking about Halo. It just took me there. It, it brings up something that my also, another experience that I had with Halo. I was in college at the time going to uh, OSU. And I remember Xbox came and set up like a. They had booths of different games that were upcoming games that you could play. But the big thing that they had was a Halo 2 tournament. And I was at the time so big into Halo 2 and so good at it. I went and played in the tournament. And I remember that the person that they put me up against was a guy who was leading the OSU campus video game uh, group. 
he started a group for gamers to multiplayer play multiplayer games and stuff. And I remember joining his clan and playing against him and with him on Halo 2 online. And I never met the guy. And then we get there and then I have to play against him in this tournament <laughs> and meet him for the first time. I'm like, whoa, yeah, dude. Oh, man, this is going to be fun. I already know he's good. He's at least on my level. And the thing is, is he beat me. And I was so upset about that because I knew I was better than him. We played on <clears throat> we played on midship and I tried to get the shotgun and he got the noob combo. Do you remember the noob combo from Halo 2? The energy pistol and a battle rifle. So what you would do is you use the energy pistol to bring down your shields, battle rifle to the head, instant kill. Oh, so he got the two. Uh, he got the energy or he got that combo and was able to take me out. Just I never easily. actually even played Halo 2. Oh, man, I was so big into that. I've game. literally <clears throat> only played the first Halo. It's those. Yeah, I think there's a Halo 2. I don't remember that being in Halo 1. But yeah, Halo was hugely influential for multiplayer. Multiplayer gaming would not be where it oh, is today absolutely. without Halo. Halo, Halo yeah. 2, both. Um, numero uno. My numero uno is Mario 64, but we went hugely in depth of that game. We so hit it hard. So uh, that's a good place to stop it. Yeah. Man, I got nothing else to talk about. I mean, this has been a long, exhausting episode. <laughs> I think we've both used every word we've ever known. Where can they but, find us? <laughs> yeah, oh, you got me. Jabgcast.com. Oh my god. I'm you hit finally... me. You hit me hard, man. I'm yes. Finally... www.jabgcast.com. That is where you'll find all of all the places you can listen to us. All of the links to the YouTube channels, our social media channels, everywhere. Everywhere you want to find us, that's where we'll be. Guys, it was fun. Thanks for joining us on this episode. Uh, we'll see you next time. I'm going home. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs>